actually, there we go. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so welcome everybody to uh, the uh, our fourth now uh, session of Meet the New Critics. Uh, today we're with Hannah Bell. She is our new critic for, well, she's got a couple of big portfolios uh, that she's juggling this time. She's got uh, environment, energy, and climate change. So it's been rejigged a little bit. It used to be environment, water, and climate change, but they've taken the water out and, and taken the energy from the transportation and infrastructure portfolio. So it's kind of mixed there and uh, as well as finance. And uh, you may have uh, known Hannah a lot better in her former critic roles, uh, particularly in uh, social development and housing, as well as uh, critic for economic growth. Um, so uh, we're really excited. We know that uh, Hannah did a huge amount in uh, her former critic roles in those other portfolios. And so uh, we're really excited to see what, uh, what you get, get up to in the next couple of years, Hannah. Hmm. No pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, pr no pressure, you know, just, That's okay. just gentle pressure, relentlessly applied. Uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I need to get my poster back up again in my background with my, with my saying, I've, I've, I need to, I don't, I'm in a temporary office space, which is masquerading as my bedroom. So if the cat wanders through one of three, then there you go. They, they usually appear at some point. So. That, that is just fine. There's usually kids or cats or something in the mix. Exactly. Um, <laughs> exactly. So, so first, uh, I'm, I'm going to start Since off. Just as no. Oh, sorry. Was somebody speaking? Yeah. I was going okay, to say I'm... just as long as nobody takes off their clothes. <laughs> like that. Yeah, that's right. Thing. Remember, we are on we are on Zoom, people. Uh, your <laughs> camera may be on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So um, I'm going to start off with uh, a few questions for uh, for Hannah, just to get the ball rolling. And then uh, you know the reason that we've we've invited you all to be a part of this is because we want to hear from you, and Hannah wants to hear from you. Yeah. Uh, your ideas, your your tips, your resources, things like that. So, um, so first of all, Hannah, uh, we, we were mentioning that, uh, you know, you uh, have spent your last two years in, in social development and housing and economic growth. And I'm just curious what you found kind of the most, um, uh, what you learned the most, you know, from that experience, or, or were there any things that you found particularly challenging or frustrating or particularly rewarding in your former roles? It's a really good question. Um... So, of course, I have a lot to say, so I'll, I'll, I'll come out that, but Jordan, perhaps before I start, I'd just like to do a really quick land acknowledgement. Oh, yes, um, of course. And just, yeah, thank you. Just to sort of, um, I'd, I'd love to, given that I'm, I'm actually just down the road from um, Ardgowan, which is uh, the only um, national park that's actually inside the city limits, and they've just installed a fantastic new signage there that is actually in English, French, and Mi'kma'ki. Um, and is really sort of telling a different story. So I think it's really important that, that we can continue to, to um, acknowledge and recognize that we're on the, on the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, who are the traditional peoples of this land we call Abiquit. Um, and it is a privilege to be coming to you across the province today from, from my little space in that, in that land. Um, I, guess, I guess it's, Jordan, the, the short answer is um, that I am continually um, shocked even and, and, and sad, even though I am very well informed now about sort of what life is like in here in PEI for a lot for for many different types of islanders of how pervasive um, poverty and the struggles associated with poverty are and how systemic they are. Um, and how important it is that that um, we we speak and talk about the things that that, that make us uncomfortable, um, you know, and make other people in power uncomfortable. One of the one of the the things that has I've been most proud of in the last few years, from when I was first elected, when it was just Peter and I, to you know the ongoing work with the full caucus, um, is bringing um, the stories of Islanders into a space that didn't, wasn't used to hearing those stories. 
Um, and that started right back at the very beginning where I spoke about homelessness and about the need for a women's shelter and about um, you know, the impact of some of our social assistance policies and about the truth of, of what poverty looks like for, for Islanders. So that, that is not received well. It's really difficult for people to hear that. And the, and the natural response often is to put back, push back and say, that, well, that's not who we are, but it is. Um, and Recording then, in progress. <laughs> Oh, it's oh, gone. Okay, so so I guess that you know the it's it's both a, a struggle, um, it's a learning, and it is um, a privilege to to have been able to work on and around that file, um, and everything that comes that comes with it, and I and I think we've made a real space for change, and we've seen really amazing change and work and narrative um, as a result of that consistent gentle pressure or not so gentle as Kerry Campbell talked about it politely bludgeoning every now and then um, to to make change happen. Okay thanks Hannah and uh, so looking to your new portfolios now are you excited for these new I portfolios? Am. I am yeah <laughs> it's funny I uh, you know, I don't know if you will realize because because we're in the Coles building um, and we have we have, you know, the whole second floor of the Coles building is the office of the official opposition, but there's 16 of us in there. So we all share offices. There's there's two or three in every office. The only person that has their office on their own is Peter. We tease him, but that's subject to change. But um, but Lynn and I share an office. So I, I kind mm. of, I, you know, I'm joking that that I'm going to kind of absorb most of her file that was her file before just by osmosis because I've been hanging out with her in the same space for the last couple of years but um you know one of the great things about our caucus and I'm sure you've heard this from other caucus members as well is we all work so closely together um that we we usually do know you know that like you're not completely absent from what's going on just because it's not your file because we we have to work together so closely on so many things whether that's you know, supporting each other on 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 work that we're doing in the house to be able to speak to it, you know, in debate, um, or or you know to be able to sort of be a good ally when it comes to to supporting work. But the other thing as well is that none of these issues are are, are separate anyway. You know, like like climate action is a human rights issue, is a housing issue, is a poverty issue, is a finance issue. So that, you know, we don't, they're not disconnected and they shouldn't be. So I'm really excited about the shift in the portfolios because I think it makes even more sense with who we are as a Green Caucus to really kind of expand and see these connections and then develop really smart policy um, and, and change as a result. Yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, Hannah. Yeah. Um, so, and of course, you know, you're you're very lucky to be uh, in the same office as Lynn and getting that osmosis. But are there certain parts of your new new portfolios that you feel you have a steeper learning curve on than others? And if so, what what kinds of things do you think those are? Well, I think I think the entire file around um, climate change, climate action, water, and and um, um, the environment in general is, is a steep learning curve just because of the expectations that come um, with that being probably one of the issues that people are most passionate about in our party. And so our grassroots, many of our grassroots were mobilized first by that action. Um, you know, social justice probably being, I think, the other, the other key one, whether that's proportional representation or, or, you know, whatever that may be. But the environment and everything to do with the environment is is the reason for being for the origins of our party and i am i am hugely aware of the weight that that carries um at the same time i'm i think i think there is a huge value too in in having recognizing and valuing that that's where the expertise also sits you know i sat in on the the meeting last night with the coalition um for the protection of pei waters and, and land and clearly you've got passionate engaged informed people so i know that i'm not sitting here you know with with empty-handed yeah. Um, so not only is there Lynn in our caucus and, you know, and obviously a number of other, you know, Michelle Beaton and Peter, and, and then we've got Pat Levesque and we've, you know, just this wealth of, of skill and knowledge, 
that the community is the place where you go. And that's what we do as one of our core values. So, you know, it, it makes it, it makes me very nervous when I had to do a live media interview the day after I got the portfolio. That was not so fun, gotta mm. say. But uh, I don't like talking points and I don't like speaking to something where I'm not comfortable enough to sort of know that I can pivot. Um, and that comes with time. But the expertise that we have is second to none. Um, you know, I just look to the people I can see even on the call here. And I know I could speak to just about everybody here and, and have something that I would learn. Yeah. And that's how I approach everything I do anyway. I'm, I'm not an expert. I'm the person that has the most things in the basket right now and the platform. Okay. Hi, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So, um, so I'm wondering now if you can um, help to give us a sense of, of what the scope of your portfolio uh, truly is. Um, you know, some of them might be kind of a little bit more uh, clear, like, you know, climate change, although that, that's obviously connected with everything. So, yep. so how do you deal with that? But, yeah. uh, but even like, you know, what all falls on, what is finance, you know, like, yeah. what would you do with that, for example? Can you just explain a little bit about what Oh, I can give you um, I can give you a short a short version like this. Uh, this is a, a really long list, and honestly, I, I I'm gonna forget some stuff. But I can tell you what's on the radar at the moment, and some of the things that I'm thinking about thinking about. Um, so on the on the, the the large what seems like the larger file, which is the environment, um, uh, energy and climate action, not climate, it's climate action now, um, are the really obvious things like like we're literally right now, the, the regulations for the Water Act, um, the um, um, investigation into the um, Brendel Farms, the, the uh, Land Matters Advisory Council, um, looking at Ag Recovery Program, um, things like soil health, um, the uh, discussions with, with various stakeholder groups about developing the, the, obviously the critical irrigation strategy that we need to inform the Water Act. Um, we've got the Environmental Bill of Rights, which is still in progress and is in consultation with Elnoy. Um, on a broader scale, there are you know, some really major things that we need to be talking about for the agriculture sector, including what a future sustainable agricultural strategy looks like, along with a sustainable water strategy. Um, you know, the other pieces on the environmental basis, we know that the carbon tax is currently being negotiated as we speak with the federal government and, and because the current um, agreement has expired. So that mm -hmm. one is coming, which obviously is not just climate, but also connects to energy um, and, and, so finance. There's a, and finance. So there's a lot there to talk about in terms of what's happening with, uh, with the, the energy strategy from a provincial perspective and how that path to net zero, which um, you know we're hearing a lot about, what does that actually look like? Are we actually gonna be able to meet it and what, big um, changes are we gonna need to make in terms of things like investments and infrastructure development, um, incentives, programming, supports, all of those things that actually encourage and, and support um, and move islanders and businesses particularly into meeting those net zero targets. From an energy perspective, that also includes things like maritime electric and the, the discussion is about rates and, and everything that connects with the Maritime Electric Agreement, wind farms, um, the energy efficiency PEI and all of the programs that come through efficiency PEI, including things like home renovation programs, which again cross over into finance. Um, so there's this really broad swath, but um, and most of those, those kind of pieces all sit under uh, Minister Myers's department and then some associated. Finance PEI is a bit more of an interesting beast because it, it is clearly the finances of the province. So I chair public accounts committee, which is the nonpartisan committee that is tasked with sort of um, oversight and um, uh, good governance of the, the public accounts. So that's things like the Auditor General's reports, the, the what are called the blue books, which are the, the financial audited statements of the entire province. Um, but we also, finance obviously is, effectively the simple list of finance is that you have revenue and you have expenses revenue are primarily taxes and fees expenses are delivery of programs and services but that includes big things like um, taxation policy 
Um, it includes things like gambling. Um, so the Lotteries Corporation is, is under the purview of finance, um, as is the Liquor Commission, the Cannabis Commission, um, the Housing Corporation, the, um, a number of things like IIDI, which is the investment development arm, which in past life would have managed the PNP program mm -hmm. um, and still has a large amount of money on file from PNP escrow files. So it's connected to immigration. Um, you know, so a lot of the, some of the interesting things that happen behind closed doors in, in government happen in finance, mm. um, including things like treasury board decisions, um, because the minister of finance is the chair of treasury board and treasury board are the main body that actually sign off on, yes, government is allowed to spend this money. So when we hear about projects and we wonder where they came from, they've always gone through treasury board. So um, that, that's a bit of a, of a gray space that we're really interested in seeing if we can find out more about um, so special warrants, for example, when government spends more than it should, so it should and gets a little kind of note after the fact that says, hey, that was okay, special warrants. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's tons of tons and tons of things to go. So, so, you know, a lot of it is in all those things, what are the things that, that I guess two or three key things that I'm looking at and that I, I really want to hear from the audience from the, the from you is what are the things um, that are a priority that we need to be asking about or focusing on or working on what are um, the things that we should be thinking about that sh we should be developing policy on so for instance a fair taxation policy it's not something that we can do we can't bring in anything that involves incurring costs to the government as official opposition. You're not allowed to do that. So we can't ever create a bill that that's, creates a new tax, but we can ask really good questions about how taxes are designed and things, and we can create our own policy for when we are government, mm -hmm. right? So, so there's, there's things we can do now, and then there's things that we can, we can do which are longer term, which are much more about who we are, and then there's there's things too that that matter to people on an on an individual or a small group basis that doesn't mean they're not important, but maybe they're much more focused. So something that comes from a farmers group may isn't necessarily going to re resonate with everybody the way the tax policy would, but it really matters to the farmers, and we need to be really speaking about it. So I hope that nice. that's 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 but it's there's a lot there. <laughs> Well, yeah, there is a lot there, and it's it's going to be uh, it, it's hard to imagine how you're going to keep track of it all because uh, it seems like any number of your portfolios can touch almost any other portfolio that exists, yeah. well, especially like finance by definition will. So uh, yeah, and so I think I think job. some of it is is knowing just where the boundaries are, like who owns it. So so you yeah. know everything in the in theory does, but but a lot of it comes down to has who has the authority. Who's the decision maker? So, yeah. you know, is the Minister of Finance the decision maker on this, or is this, a, you know, a financial decision that's managed within the department? And that's usually how we decide. So the Minister of Finance is actually the decision maker on that big picture stuff, the, the, the big decisions about like Treasury Board decisions, um, gambling, gambling licenses, um, setting up new corporations, and overall on taxation policy. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's open it up to our participants. Uh, so we're looking, again, we're looking for your ideas about, uh, you know, priority uh, areas that, uh, that you think Hannah should, uh, should be focused on uh, in her next couple of years. Uh, we're looking at, uh, do you have any tips about, you know, issues that you think should be on her radar? Are there people she, she should be talking to? Yeah. Um, are there books she should be reading or, or you know, like other resources that um, that will really point her in, in some good directions here. Um, so I see that a few of you already know how to use the raise hand function, which is great. So uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with it, uh, typically you'll find that under uh, your Zoom toolbar under reactions. You just go to reactions and one of them should be to raise your hand. Uh, depending on the device that you're on, you might have to go to the dot, dot, dot more button and uh, you might see the raise hand feature somewhere there. If you can't, just feel free to uh, type in the chat that, um, that you'd like to speak. 
uh, and uh, and I'll make sure that you get on the on the list there. Um, also, I'm going to share a link with you in the chat right now, and that is an idea board, which I'm going to be using to take notes of all the ideas and tips and everything that come in. And I've got four sections, one for environment, one for energy, climate change, and finance, so that we can keep it organized. But I'm sharing this with you all as well, so that uh, at any time during this call, or even after this call for the next few days, uh, if there's something that pops into your head that you forgot to say, or you know didn't get a chance to say, just and, and you know just just pop it in, pop a note in there, and that way we'll we'll capture all of that. And I'm going to give Hannah the full export of this you know idea board afterwards, and uh, she'll have access to it. This is so, why we like it when Jordan organizes things. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Nothing gets lost, okay? Yeah. Um, so let's go to David Woodbury was the first to have his hand up. So uh, David, over to you. Uh, you're on, you're muted if you're trying to speak right now. There you are. There. Okay. Uh, hello, Hannah. Hi, Great David. To see you. Um, I in in I I don't. I'm not an expert in the sense of science and uh, all of that, but I am uh, uh, quite an activist, as you well know. Mm -hmm. um, there are some really great uh, people who have the expertise that you should definitely uh, use, <laughs> as I said in the chat, you know, inside and outside of the party. Yeah. Um, but uh, one thing that occurs to me is that I just came back from uh, uh, from Quebec City, so I'm in uh, isolation now. Uh, it's uh, not too unpleasant to be here looking at uh, Wrights Creek and uh, it's very beautiful. But um, one thing that strikes me is that uh, I was using uh, um, Google Maps quite a bit uh, on the way back, finding really nice ways to get through uh, New Brunswick. And um, it occurs to me that if you use Google Maps, uh, it's very nice to enter your destination, but uh, you need to have the uh, directions, like the first turn you have mm -hmm. to make. And this is something that governments have been avoiding, it seems to me. It's very easy to talk about what we'll do in 2050 or 2030, mm -hmm. uh, but what, what can we do now? This, I think this is something that, uh, you know, whether or not you can force this government to do what should be done, you can let the voting public know that we have something that we want to do right away, as soon as we possibly can do something, that we're not just talking about 40 years in the future and the catastrophe that will be unavoidable by then, but we're talking about what we can do right now. Now, another thing is uh, thinking about finance. I am definitely not a finance person, but it seems to me that, and I know that a lot of this is at the federal level and you might not be able to do anything in this regard, but we have been giving, governments in Canada have been giving money to the people who are responsible for the terrible uh, climate catastrophe that is impending, oh. it's actually happening. I mean, there, there was a, uh, uh, a tornado in Montreal yesterday. Uh -huh. Okay, this is something that's, that was unheard of. Yeah. So we have been giving money to the people who are contributing to the problem instead of taxing them, of making them pay to fix what they're, they've been causing. So I don't know how much can be done at the provincial level, but if there's any kind of uh, subvention or uh, support being given to any fossil fuel company, that should be stopped immediately and they should be heavily taxed. So that's finance. Yep. That's my two cents. Okay. Thank you, David. Yeah, one, one of the things that we've talked about before, and it's, and it's certainly from a policy perspective, you're right, like the federal subsidies to, 
to um, you know polluters is a, is a federal level, but on the provincial level, one of the things we can do is be clear about divesting our funds so that we're not yes. we're not investing our our our, our funding and our funds into into polluting companies. So, you know, there are there are things that we can do that are not just performative. They're actually putting our money where our mouth is, you mm -hmm. know, and that and that's that's the kind of policy that we could enact at, at, a, at a provincial level or push to have enacted at a provincial level. So I really appreciate mm -hmm. the input. Thank you, David. Thank you. Hey, thank you, David. Uh, so we're going to go over to Catherine O'Brien. No stranger to danger there either. You've got uh, <laughs> you've got some experience in the environment, don't you? Uh, just a little bit. Uh, uh, hi, Catherine. Hi. Nice to see you again. Nice to see you, and thank you so much, Hannah, for uh, for attending the webinar last night. Um, I won't go over too much about that, but I know you're heading into a couple of very important meetings yeah. on Thursday, um, and I just wanted to again uh, make sure that it's on your. Oh. Irrigation strategy, yeah. and I'm. I'm hearing that uh, it, it was initiated by the Federation of Agriculture, perhaps with the Potato Board, and I think the organic growers are involved as well. Um, and again, it's it's not so much the strategy. I'm hoping it's a fantastic strategy. We all hope that's, but it's it's really that it has been behind closed doors, and there's been no public consultation. It's a very very important piece of. Uh, of the puzzle for the Water Act, and uh, so I, I guess I guess I'm just asking to really, you know, make sure that that's um, made clear. Yeah. Um, along with the drought contingency plan as well, we're very concerned about that, of course, because of yeah. what happened in the Dunk River. The other thing I just I was actually going to speak about the uh, divestments. Um, and I think it's one thing too, I, I really hope that the province does, but also make it very public. Because yeah. I think a lot of people that also have their own personal investments may not be aware because we're investing in, you know, in mutual funds and they're, they're all over the place. Um, yeah, yeah. But, but there is a way that you can actually choose to not invest in, in fossil fuel uh, companies. So it'd be great if the province says, hey, we're doing this and then, and then maybe um, guide us to where else we could invest. I mean, you can't really be investment advisors, but you know what I mean? Just let yeah. us know that you've done that. Um, the other thing I just I don't want to take up all the questions, but um, uh, something that hasn't been brought up a lot because we're always talking about with the Water Act about water quantity. Mm -hmm. But of course, the water quality is also a big issue and uh, the nitrate issue is still very huge, especially up west. Um, and also, when we do our water testing, when people test their private wells, it's $130 if you want to do your, um, your chemistry and your biology testing. That's a lot of money for people. It is. And also, it doesn't test for specific pesticides. And people don't know that. They think chemistry is going to test for everything, and it doesn't. Unless you ask, you have to actually pay even more money, and you have to know what test pesticides you're testing for. When I asked George Summers about that, he suggested that residents themselves actually have to go to the farmer who's neighboring their property and ask them what they're spraying in order to figure out what to test for. And I don't think that's right. No. The other thing is they did free testing for, for nitrates once upon a time. I think that should be brought back. And I think there should be free testing anyway. And I, here's a crazy idea. I'm just throwing it out there. What if actually we had somebody come to our door and say, we're going to test your water. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea, Catherine. I mean, you know, this is one of the things that you've probably seen us be quite successful with is we've got a number of different tools in the legislature that we can use, you know, and we get there's always a lot of focus on legislation, but legislation is, is actually in theory, supposed to be really hard for the, for the official opposition to do. And we are limited because we can't do things that have a cost. So something like that, where we're saying, hey, you need to do it for free. We couldn't do that through legislation as if, but we can through a motion. Right, which is which is that can be incredibly effective because you're you're making the legislators on the floor actually have to make a commitment, and it, you know and and we've we've had really good success with those in the past in terms of basically shaming government into into taking action and and it gives you a space where you can talk about it you know because motions also allow for this great basically 
debate that doesn't have many restrictions on it. So that that's an example right there, one where we could we could do a call for that and then actually follow it up with a motion in the house, you know, calling on the government to provide free water testing. So I mean, there, there's that's something that maybe we could have an offline chat about about how, you know what might be the best route. But that's that's mm -hmm. that's the kind of thing that there's some, lots of different ways that we could really get that out into the forefront, and it could have a lot of impact because it, because of the, the chance to tell the story about why this matters. You know, I really also love you know what you said following on from David is about divestments. Um, um, absolutely leading by example sort of you know there's a huge thing in there of government you know rather than making it into a bad thing is is you know you lead by example you demonstrate again you put your money's where your money where your mouth is literally in this case and you show what what a leader a climate leader would do um and it's about making it that it's not sort of all oh, those crazy green people over there it's you know it's it's actually a good investment advisor can answer this for you and they're going to say yes we can do that and you're not going to lose any money doing it. In fact, you're probably going to have a more well, well, a better performing fund in the long run, right? So, so, um, and just for the information for everyone else who may not all be as on the ball as Catherine with the thing in the the weird joy of being a legislature legislature when you're not in the house is we have committee meetings, um, which is where some of these sort of more detailed discussions happen around around particularly around policy. And this week, there's actually a double header committee meeting of the Natural Resources and Environmental Sustainability Committee on Thursday. And the meeting in the morning is on the irrigation strategy. And the meeting in the afternoon is on the Land Matters Advisory Committee. So it's a pretty heavy duty set of things. And we actually had a very long and complicated and um, engaged discussion in it today. Um, in our caucus with everybody who's going to attend and our policy people to figure out how to get to exactly what we need to get to, Catherine, to talk about the irrigation strategy, to get timelines, to get clear answers on context and, and bring bring as much of this out in the open as we can, because we're very aware that, that everybody's been blindsided by this and that's not okay. So I, I, I feel confident that our caucus is going to do you proud in terms of, 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 of pulling what we can and, and having that happen in public. And that's, and that's what needs to happen. We have to have these conversations when these decisions are being made in the public space, not in the minister's office. So, so stay tuned on that one. Thanks, Hannah. Thank you. And I'll follow up with you about the, um, about the, the water testing. I think that's a really, really fantastic idea. So, yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. Those are good, uh, concrete suggestions. Um, so, and I see that there's a few other people who've just uh, joined us. So, welcome. And uh, just to fill you in on where we're at right now, we're just uh, opening the floor to anybody that has any uh, ideas that they'd like to uh, share with Hannah as far as what you think uh, she should prioritize working on uh, in the next couple of years as critic for environment, energy, climate change, and finance. Uh, or if there are any uh, tips you have as far as people she should talk to, resources she should access for information to learn more about these uh, portfolio areas of hers. And uh, you can raise your hand using the raise hand function, or if you're not sure where that is, uh, just put an asterisk in the uh, chat as uh, David uh, just recently suggested there, and we'll get you on the speakers list so that, uh, so that you can speak. Um, I'm going to go over to Anne McKay, who's got her hand up now. Anne, would you like to speak? Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can. <laughs> I'm here. Not used to speaking to more than one person. Oh, wow. Well. <laughs> anyway, uh, I'll sort of go along here. What uh, something that has been pointed out to me, I suppose, um, and it, it's been in the news related to, you know, the uh, out in BC, the the old um, Fairy Creek. The, pardon me. Fair, is it Fair, Fairy Creek? Yes. Where, where um, it's the cost of wood is so high now that everything's being cut down everywhere. Mm -hmm. They can get their hands on it or sneak in to do that. But um, uh, it, it sort of came up. I have a neighbor who owns a fair beautiful <laughs> piece of property. And um, they, she, this person has made trails through her property, through their woodland, or the 
huge amount of walking we do every day with our dogs. And um, that in the, this kind of comes under finance here, property tax. And then it comes under, um, you know, environment, climate change, that when personal property or communities may have these large wood lots or woodland of some sort, they, um, especially, but for private owners, just the, the way they're taxed and the benefits that especially this person has put into their woodland, I'm just calling it woodland or woods or, mm -hmm. um, it's a huge area that we we usually hike about four or more kilometers every day. Oh. And, um, but this person desperate, not desperate, they want to protect it and, and save it for the future. And, and, but is there some system or way that could work maybe into the property tax or something to do with climate change or mm -hmm. the carbon tax, if we ever get a real one. And um, that the benefit of this person doing that and not only that, just the wildlife, everything that's in that woods and, and the springs and brooks and very old hemlock trees, um, you name it, it's in that woods. And it is just stunning to, mm -hmm. to have the pleasure to be a guest to this person to go through her woods every day. And our dog lives for it. Well, it's mm -hmm. not my daughter's dog, but... Yeah. Apparently, I'm the designated walker. So, you're the um, you're the designated dog mom, are you? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So, well, I, it's just I'm I'm not perhaps making a whole lot of. No, I know, I know and, what you mean. Yeah, you. I mean, we're talking about about um, needing to maintain something we have that is that is irreplaceable because you know right. the, yeah. when you talk about. Um, woodlot, you know, wood woodlot as a as a as a yeah as an asset you know it, it it doesn't speak to the value um and we saw this i'm thinking i'm looking at roy and thinking of plan b and the you know yeah. the, the work of trying to sort of really you know preserve irre irreplaceable spaces and okay. and we don't have kind of we don't sometimes we don't think of that here in pei in the way that we have them like in fairy creek because we're not talking about but but we still do i mean and, I, and i'm with you i mean i've been there are places where you can go in, in pei and it's magic uh, they're yeah. they're magical mm -hmm. So, you know, on a, on a, the, the property taxes generally on, on, on developed land are generally very low. Mm -hmm. um, so there, so there's, there's not a kind of an incentive to, try, to turn them over from the asset value. Obviously what we're worried about right now is a couple of things. And one of them is, as you said, the value of, of wood, though standing mm -hmm. scrub wood and, and standing wouldn't necessarily have no, a high market value. Is. Yeah, no. yeah, but it's but it's also development in general is 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 the biggest threat, and sometimes that development is agricultural, um, and sometimes it's expansion for for building. Mm -hmm. But we do know the other side of that is there's a there's a forestry report that's done every decade um, that talks about the sort of the, the state of our and right now, where the the current the next forest report isn't actually due we think until next year. But the minister gave a very somber hint of what's coming in it and it's and it's horrifying because what it says is we've lost I, I have to double check the numbers Darcy will probably know but I think it's I think it's almost 20 percent of our of our forest has gone in in the last 20 years yeah. um and that is not something that you can then reply like that's that's generations of of mm -hmm. growth right that are gone and mm -hmm. and our best route to to you know for carbon capture is forests <laughs> like yeah. it's it's you know and 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 so we have to not only have an aggressive um strategy to to replant and reforest pei which we're not going to benefit from directly you know in terms of carbon capture for a generation at least mm -hmm. but we have to preserve what we've got so that's kind of a really long answer um to, to but but it's an important topic and it's a huge piece of, of this file that I now have. And one of that one of that is is what creative ways, like you were talking about there, can we incentivize 
landowners to maintain what they have? How do we help them maintain it, look after it and value it for what it is, right. which is way more than a woodlot, right? Yeah. And, and way more than potentially lumber or anything else. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect that we've got in there too is the preservation of green spaces through things like Island Nature Trust and, and right. you know, right. other pieces. So, that, so there's a couple of different things, but, but I think, Anne, your, you know, your point around, it's, it's we have to incentivize individuals who have that prosperity as well as larger projects, right? That's right. Well, th this yeah, this person is is you know financially fine, but yeah. somebody who isn't um, and goes look, um, somebody wants to build a subdivision in here. And there's asset value in that, right? If there is that's financial the problem yeah. that uh, I mean somewhere, um, and the, the, the property taxes are just skyrocketing. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. only because a neighbor puts up their house for 600, 700,000 and you go, holy mm. jumpers, they're going to be looking here. No. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't know. I don't know enough about the how the property taxes reflect on that kind of thing. So this is definitely mm -hmm. something I can do some follow up on for sure. And but well, but I do think it, I do think it connects to, to something we've you know, we're going to hear over and over again on this file, which is about the need for a long term strategy. And the strategy right. can't just be, you know, a, something we talk about or a piece of paper that someone sticks. Like it has to actually, to David's point, it has to, it has to have tangible actions. What are we going to do right now? So we have something, a foundation to build that strategy on. So can we, like, do we need a moratorium on cutting down any more wood in PEI? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, right? Like, Maybe. honestly, you know, we, if well, we've lost 20%, we can't afford right. to cut down anymore. So let's stop cutting it down until we have a strategy that everybody can agree is good. Maybe that's the kind of big thing we need to do. Or, or that this, at least, if there's going to be some change of how a carbon tax is given to the people, not the, yeah. I know the government is the people, but maybe in yeah. the case of this, they would have, this is part of somewhere in the carbon tax law or, or yeah. Um, well, I mean, and that can be, that that doesn't, that could be multiple things, right? We can yeah, have multiple channels in the same way you do with it, within it, but that's a really good point. So I'll add it to the list. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just thought I'd bring it up. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. And no, it's great. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Anne. Let's keep them coming. I see we've got three people with their hands up there. I'm just going to once again uh, share the link to the idea board for those that may have just recently entered. This is where uh, I'm taking notes from ideas that people uh, are uh, providing here. But you can also go into that board and add your own notes if you like. If there's something that you know you just think about and and uh, uh, you don't necessarily, uh, you know, have the time to, or the opportunity, or desire to to speak about it out loud. Just just stick them in there. Um, I'm going to go over to Roy now. Roy, would you like to unmute yourself and speak? Okay. Yeah. Um, hi, I think Roy. the point. Hi, Hannah and everyone. Uh, I wanted to make the uh, kind of a general point that if we're really going to deal with climate change, we have to have an ongoing um, evaluation of where we are mm -hmm. and what we're doing and is it actually changing the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and like forestry is a good example where they do a forest survey every 10 years while the IPC says we've only got 10 years. Yeah. So are we going to wait for 10, another 10 years to, to do the evaluation on the forest? Obviously, we can't. And obviously, around transportation and agriculture use of, and carbon production, car, you know, we have to get concrete numbers all the way across the board. And then every year, they, there's got to be a report card that goes public that goes, OK, you know, forestry did really piss poor, that thumbs down. Uh, the, the transportation sector did a little better, you know, and every year it's got to come back. Otherwise, we're, we're just kind of in the dark. And I think the general public just feels, oh, well, you know, it's like forestry. It's for the forests are there. We've been cutting down the hedgerows. We're planting plantations. We're doing clear cutting. And for most people, they don't see it. And, that, you know, 
10 years later, it's all gone. And they're going to say, oh, dear, we, mm -hmm. we, you know, we messed up. And I, and I think that uh, that should apply to every aspect that, uh, you know, relates to, uh, to, to, to climate change and to, to, the, to the carbon's uh, production. Um, and, um, you know, like with, with forestry right now, like right now there's a federal program that, that they got this tree planting. They're going to plant like, I don't know how many billions of trees across the country. I don't know what they're doing on PEI, but that, that should not go into plantations. It should no. go into restoring old growth forests. And, you know, that's, uh, that's, that's essential, you know? And um, so I guess that, that's the kind of thing I think, you know, is there's gotta be a general overall evaluation. Okay, here's our targets for climate change and in, in the transportation sector and agriculture, sector, whatever it is. And every year, you know, we get the numbers back and we go, okay, because otherwise we're going to wake up in, in 2030 and go, oh, well, we didn't. It's like the feds, the liberals do it all the time. We're yeah. going to do all this great stuff. And then five years, everybody kind of forgets about it. And five or years later, oh, well, we missed those targets. And then five and half the time, you don't, you don't even know what the targets were and where they actually really going to work, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's a critical element. And then in terms of the forestry, like the opportunities when they do come along, like something like this federal program for tree planting, you know, Gary's so upset if, they, if, if they're just gonna dump in a bunch of white spruce or something, you yeah. know, uh, we've, we've got to take those opportunities, you know, to, to, to do better. I guess that's all I'd say for now, thanks. Thank you, Roy. No, it's, I, I knew I'd hear about the trees from you. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I think it really, it's a really important point though. It's like not all programs are good programs, you know, like, like and, I, and I think that we've seen that before. We, we don't want to, I think we need to get over some of our cliches. We can look a gift horse in the mouth if they're, if they're going to send us crappy white spruce. So like we, we need, we need to be, to be um, pushing hard for what we want and, and making it a priority. But I think your bigger point around the, um, that overall evaluation. I know that's work that Lynn's obviously done a huge amount on, um, but we're having, you know, we're, we've really, we're really hitting that, hit that roadblock of, of government not wanting to sort of let data out, but we're way past the, the excuse of, oh, it's because of COVID now. We're like, and, and, I, and I'm, I'm hopeful that, that, that they've used up that excuse and we can really hammer to get um, the data and the, and the benchmarking so that we have that annual reporting process is a priority. I absolutely agree with you 100% on that. Roy, thank you. Yeah, and I think we need to get as many people commenting on that stuff. Like, yeah. I don't know, in terms of the indigenous community, like I think it's a critical element and we're, you know, we're there, we're talking, you know, in terms of marrying the scientific and the indigenous mm -hmm. uh, approaches, you know, and it seems that that's, people are listening right now to that. And it would be critical and really important, I think, an opp opportune now to find people in that community to speak to some of these issues around forestry. Or I know they there are some, but uh, I think we could do maybe better than we're, than what, what we've been done, doing so far. You know, around getting indigenous people to, you know, not not necessarily speak through the party, but just that whenever there's an opportunity, make sure that their voices are heard. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, let's go over to Jeannie. You know, she has a lot of experience in forestry as well. Yeah. Sure if that's what she's gonna talk about, but we'll see. <laughs> Sorry, had trouble unmuting. Um, yeah, well, I don't wanna take a lot of time, more time about forestry because we've, there's probably other, other issues, but I have a lot of concerns. Um, and I think, I don't know, somehow I'd like to have a group formed to discuss this and maybe move forward on it. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that where I think we're running okay. short of time. Oh, I, I, that's a, I love that idea, Jeannie. You know, you know, I'll call you to talk to you about it. So. That's, that's, that's great. I'd love to. It'd be an excuse well, to yeah. give you a shout and have a chat. So, okay, you're on. Okay, thanks. And, and Jeannie, well, we there, connect you with Roy. Well, I, I we, we have been. 
Okay. That, you know, I don't know whether it would be worthwhile looking at reestablishing the um, the forest uh, advisory committee. Mm. The province had one at some mm. point, 15, 20 years ago. I'll um, find out. You know, it yeah, might I'll be. I'll find worth... out because I'm supposed to be meeting with the minister, and that I, I, I'm putting up to a list of questions and sort of what what am I going to give him grief over? So politely. So okay. I think that's a really that's a really good one. Okay, great. Um, I've got uh, Rita Jackson's hand up. Rita. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I was late. I was out planting my garden. Oh, uh, <laughs> excuse. Yeah. yeah. So I have uh, a point for you, Hannah. Is sure. that um, Iraq and land acquisition, mm -hmm. and Iraq doesn't seem to be enforcing the rules that are already in place. Yeah. But just for example, if I bought a piece of land and uh, I'm allowed a, a thousand acres, but 500 acres are covered in forest, just as an example. Mm -hmm. So they're considered non-arable land. I can't use them to grow blueberries. So mm -hmm. it doesn't count in my acquisition. So it's only 500 acres, even though I have a thousand. Then I clear cut the 500 acres, drain it, use it to grow blueberries, and nobody counts it. And, and Iraq doesn't notice or doesn't enforce. Okay, I'm beating a dead horse, am I? You well, know, no, but, but, it's, oh, it's, an but... it's an important point because um, it's something that people don't realize. Um, and it's and it's a it's the great big hole in Iraq is that Iraq does not have the power to enforce. They are they are a regulatory and appeals commission, um, so they're a quasi judicial organization. So so they can they can investigate and bring forward something you know on complaint, and there are processes to do that. But they don't have a proactive role to go and find. And then do something about when the laws when when their laws are broken. So we see this all the time with rentals, um, and we see it also with land acquisition. So I mean, if, you know, most of the stuff that has come forward has come forward because they because people have gotten caught and it's been raised. People and then other people have raised it, uh, appealed it, or brought it forward. But Iraq itself doesn't actually have that authority. Um, so it's it's actually a failure in the legislation. Um, and, and one of the things that the land advice, the land matters advisory group has to has been asked to look at, and this was something that came out of the Brendel report and other reports, are that um, there needs to be like a legislative update, like that that legislation needs to be tightened to be, and it needs to we need to address those those because if there's loopholes that are legal, there's not a lot you can do, and if there are things that where they say this is the limit of our scope, um, then we have to fix it. And, and so, you know, that it's the long and short answer. And Iraq is also one of those things because it's arm's length, because it's quasi judicial, there's also a lot of trouble. There's a lot of challenges in terms of who's got the authority to do that. <laughs> so we, you know, it, it gets really muddy really fast, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. Okay. Uh, and um, the other point being that there are certain corporations that have used the loopholes to uh, accumulate thousands of acres more than they should and the government seems to be helping disguise it like if you try and look up a corporation and you you have great difficulty and peter rukavina did quite a bit on it a long time ago but um, the government is making it easy to hide and very difficult to find the facts to make a complaint and I think that has to be addressed. It's not a regulation or a law. It's just skullduggery. <laughs> yeah, there, there is definitely some systems in place that do not um, make things easy. And, and Peter Rukavino found, you know, like I said, he did fantastic work. And so then they changed the system so that he couldn't do it anymore. Um, we do have a new business registry, but it is only from a certain date forward. So that new that our business registry from a certain date forward does allow you to find out who the shareholders in a company are. So you can't have anonymous numbered companies, but it doesn't help us for all existing companies that were in the old registry. And so now our next 
like you said, Rita, it's like, you know, you move one step forward and then you go a couple sideways and one back and then another one that way. Um, and so the next the next challenge is going to get them to make those changes retroactively. And they're and they're arguing right now it's it's too it take, we don't have enough staff. Um, so so the louder we are about about um, you know accuracy and, and transparency and 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 you know the laws actually have to apply to everybody um otherwise what's the point of having them then that that has to be a consistent message from us and that's something that i think you know we we do we do a really good job of in the official opposition is is as a caucus is you know we are really clear about how important good governance is um and it, and it it we we are we do a good job of making government very uncomfortable asking these difficult questions so we'll keep doing it okay um that's great. We've oh, I, and I see that Catherine uh, has her hand up uh, one more time here. So we <laughs> we got a couple more minutes, Catherine. I'm sorry. I, I, I kind of scanned to see if anybody else had their hand up. I don't want to eat up anybody else's time. I just have a quick question, Hannah. I I may have spoken out of turn last night. Someone asked me about development on uh, wetlands, and yeah. I thought I, I knew that the original Environmental Protection Act was pretty gray um, and that if it was in the public interest, you could whatever. But as far as I know, under the new Water Act, no, but I, I am actually not now all that clear. <laughs> Yeah, and, and honestly, I, I made a note to myself to go and check as well, Catherine, because um, only because I just very recently had the great pleasure to sit in a meeting with um, Tim Banks, who very gleefully told us about um, how he had, he was able to do development on wetlands because he had a, a permit that had been granted in 1986, and it was grandfathered in. So um, that was pretty much the face I made. So the, 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 their yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer, and I'm, I'm and I'm going to tell you when I don't know. So I don't know, but I will find out. Um, I am I am nervous about that as well. Um, you know, we have we know that there is more complexity now from a number of other factors like um, crown lands and indigenous land claims and so on. But but a lot of development happens in sort of a don't ask, don't tell space too. So you know, we need to be. And I think that's some that you know, there's been a lot of conversation about that kind of development happening in and around Charlottetown. Yeah. Um, right. So, so I, yeah, I something, yeah, I do think it's something we really need to be mindful of. Okay. Um, so again, I think perhaps that's, I'll follow up on that with you. I'm, I have it on my list to do some digging. Great. Thanks, Hannah. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I don't see any more hands up. We're at just past eight o'clock. So uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to thank you again, everybody uh, who came here today and uh, offered your ideas. Yeah. Of course, this isn't the end of offering ideas. <laughs> we, uh, I, I shared the link to that idea board. I'm going to leave it up for a few more days. So if there's anything else you want to add, just pop some notes in there. I noticed that one of the things we didn't really talk about very much today was the energy part of Hannah's por portfolio. Although I see somebody put a, a note there to make Maritime Electric a public utility. So we got one thing but if you think of anything else just please I'll get right uh, on that yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and I think um what I'd like to Jordan is just like you said you've got this great tool that that Jordan's put together to, for sharing um I've got my notes that I took on here but I think you all know um I may not get back to you the day that you write to me I think we all kind of struggle with that the the flood of of contact um but um, I'm always, as every member of the caucus is always open to, to hearing feedback and to getting sort of inquiries and suggestions. So please do feel that you can reach out to me. Like I said, right back at the beginning, the only way I'm going to, um, to learn and to, to be the best advocate I can for the things that matter to the community is if the community tells me what those are. Um, I am hoping to do some, a couple of virtual or virtual in-person town halls. Jordan doesn't know this yet, but I've got a list. Um, and, um, and, and these are, these are the kind of things also, you know, I love the idea of doing something around forestry. I love the idea of doing something around, around, um, you know, uh, what we can do as individuals, you know, from the, um, the perspective of, of climate change, how do we empower people? So that's something I'm going to be working on. So stay tuned for that over the summer. Um, and Hey, I'm actually even thinking about doing a strawberry social. So yeah. I'll keep you posted for that too. But thanks for, for all of your great questions.
questions and input and um, it's it's always such a privilege to be with everybody so thank you great thank you hannah and uh i'm just going to remind you that if you enjoyed uh tonight's conversation uh you're sure to enjoy the conversation next tuesday june 29th with peter bevan baker uh, because he has, well, he, he, he has always been uh, the critic for uh, Indigenous and Francophone and intergovernmental affairs, but this time he actually took himself another portfolio, which is agriculture and land, which is something that's come up a lot, even in this conversation. So I am just going to put the details for that in the chat here. You can click on that link and you can get registered for that right this second. And, uh, and there will be obviously more information about that uh, going out as well. Uh, and then uh, in the weeks after that, we're, we're still going to be talking to uh, Trish Altas. Um, and she is, uh, her new portfolio is, um, uh, oh my gosh. Economic growth, tourism and culture. Economic growth, tourism and culture. <laughs> uh, we've got Carla Bernard, who's taken on the social development and housing portfolio that Hannah used to have. And she's still the uh, critic for the status of women as well. Um, and, uh, and Michelle Beaton has moved into health and wellness. So she's, mm -hmm. uh, she's gonna be coming up too. Uh, so in the next few weeks, we have lots more great discussions. And of course, there's gonna be more, more with Hannah. There's gonna be lots of opportunities to, uh, to have these kinds of great discussions. So uh, thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening. Bye everybody, thank you. Bye. Thanks, Jordan.